Oh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Could you move over? Because I'll be sitting there. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Mark Krikorian. I'm executive director of the Center for Immigration Studies. And we're doing this panel because, obviously, the Ukrainian refugee issue is a big deal both for the United States, which is the main focus of the Center for Immigration Studies' work, and obviously even more so in Europe. And so what we wanted to do was bring people who have experience and have looked at the issue of dealing with this Ukrainian refugee crisis following the Russian invasion, but from both sides of the Atlantic. And so we have some um, uh, notable and informed speakers on this. Our first speaker is going to be Christoph Veresh, who's a senior researcher at the Migration Research Institute in Budapest and a visiting fellow here at the Center for Immigration Studies. And he's going to talk about the European Union response to the Ukrainian refugee crisis. Our next speaker is Jadwiga Emilevich, who is a member of the Polish parliament, former deputy prime minister, and is a special advisor to the prime minister on the refugee issue. So she's uniquely placed to talk about Poland's experience with Ukrainian refugees, and of course, Poland is the one that's hosting the largest number, and uh, she's going to be releasing some data that they've done from a survey uh, that has not been released before this. Our third speaker will be Mark Varga, who's a senior researcher at the Migration Research Institute in Budapest, and he examined um, the situation in Romania and Moldova, and we'll be talking some about how they have dealt with Ukrainian refugee issue. And then last but not least, Nayla Rush, a senior researcher at CIS, will talk about the U.S. response, um, uh, the, specifically this Uniting for Ukraine program and more broadly how the United States has responded to the Ukrainian refugee issue. Once they're all finished, I'll moderate um, Q&A, but we'll start with Christoph. Thank you. Uh, since the onset of the Russian invasion, roughly one-third of Ukrainians have been forced from their homes. This is the largest human displacement crisis in the world today. According to a new UNHCR estimate, more than 7 million people remain internally displaced within Ukraine and more than 15 million people require immediate humanitarian assistance inside Ukraine. According to estimates, four point, more than 4.9 million Ukrainian refugees uh, are inside uh, the EU right now. Uh, at the beginning of the crisis, everyone was uh, referencing uh, the border crossing data, like how many people crossed into Poland, how many people uh, uh, crossed into Hungary. But uh, honestly, it's difficult, uh, difficult to uh, estimate the, the percentage of Ukrainians uh, that were just uh, guest workers commuting back and forth, and also those ones uh, uh, who continued uh, to other um, European countries inside uh, the Schengen area. On the map that you can see on the screen, uh, the refugee population corresponds with the size of the, the green circles. This is based uh, on estimates, not on border crossings. Uh, obviously, the most refugees are in Poland, 1.1 million. Uh, the second country is Germany with uh, 780,000. Germany is not a frontline country, obviously. Uh, the third one is the Czech Republic with 360,000 uh, uh, people. In Hungary, there are approximately 100, 120,000 refugees. In Romania, 90,000. And in Slovakia, 78,000. The refugees arriving from Ukraine are mostly children and uh, women and elderly people because Ukraine prohibited men aged 18 to 60 from leaving the country to make them available for uh, military conscription. Um, I put this uh, map up for uh, for two reasons. This is a map from Frontex, the European Border and Coastal Agency. The first is to so show the distribution of uh, internally displaced people or IDPs inside U Ukraine. As you can see, in the western region of the country, there are uh, more than 2 million IDPs. Obviously, this is the 
the part of the country which is furthest from the war. At the same time, where the fighting is the most intense in the eastern region, we also have approximately 2 million people. In the central and north region of the, of the country, we have approximately 1.5 million people uh, in the north and 1.5 million uh, in the central uh, region. The second reason this map is important is because of the recent, uh, very recent trends in the refugee uh, movement. Uh, during the first uh, week of June, almost uh, 18,000 more Ukrainians uh, left the EU and returned to Ukraine, as opposed to those who left. And during the, the last week of May, this number was 40,000. So right now, um, there is more people uh, returning to Ukraine um, then are uh, leaving the country. This was also recently c uh, confirmed by the Ukrainian National Railways uh, that noted that uh, the trains uh, coming uh, to Kiev from the western region to the country are usually 90-95% full uh, or were full at the end of May and at the beginning of, uh, beginning of June. Uh, now I'm going to talk a bit about the European, uh, the EU's response uh, to, the uh, to the crisis. The European response to the refugee crisis was swift and decisive. Uh, the EU triggered the Temporary Protection Directive on the 4th of March, uh, which gives uh, temporary protection uh, for uh, all uh, people that has a legal uh, residence in Ukraine, so not just citizens. Uh, they have a residence permit for the entire duration of the protection, access to employment, uh, housing, social welfare, medical treatment, education, um, but they don't have to go through the lengthy asylum process um, of, uh, of uh, European countries. Um, the only... Uh, uh, the directive uh, postulates that even though the Ukrainians entering the bloc can choose where they uh, register for the temporary protection directive, but once they registered uh, in one specific country, then uh, they have to stay in that country and they can only receive the benefits uh, in, uh, in that uh, specific country. At the beginning of June, uh, approximately 3.2 million uh, uh, Ukrainians have registered uh, for uh, for the temporary protection uh, schemes of the 27 uh, uh, European uh, countries. Now moving on uh, uh, to Hungary specifically. Uh, it is very important to, uh, to note that uh, refugees are not only crossing directly from Ukraine, but also a significant number of people crossed into Hungary uh, from Romania. Uh, since the start of the invasion, uh, 1.2 million Ukrainian citizens and uh, legal residents uh, crossed into Hungary from Ukraine and from uh, Romania. But most of these people uh, didn't choose uh, to stay uh, in this country. As of, as of last week, uh, only uh, 24,000 uh, claims were submitted to the Hungarian authorities uh, for temporary protection. The actual number of uh, Ukrainian refugees in Hungary is higher, though. According to government estimates, it should be between 100,000 and 140,000 people uh, at the end of May. Uh, I have to stress again that since, uh, since Hungary doesn't have border controls with, uh, with Austria, Slovakia and uh, Slovenia, it's difficult to, to estimate how many people actually leave the country uh, after, uh, after entering it from, uh, from Ukraine uh, and Romania. Because of this trend that I just described, Hungary can uh, be identified not just as a frontline country, but also as a transit country uh, during this uh, refugee crisis, which means that most of the refugees in Hungary only require temporary help before they continue their journey to other uh, European country. The cornerstone of the Hungarian government's uh, response to the refugee crisis was that uh, they distributed uh, a large amounts of funds among uh, refugee NGOs, and they also took the role uh, to coordinate their activities so that, uh, the maxima so that to maximize the uh, efficiency of uh, these resources and to avoid duplications uh, of the efforts of, uh, of NGOs. On the, on the map that you can see on the screen, this is the Hungarian-Ukrainian border. Uh, we have five uh, border crossings, which now are uh, operating 24-7s. Uh, 
Um, at, the, at the border, the Ukrainian refugees have 24-7 uh, access to medical care in temporary facilities. Um, uh, these facilities are equipped by mobile pharmacies uh, to provide medicine for chronic diseases. Uh, the bulk of the medicine comes from the National Health Care Reserve, which is Hungary's uh, strategic stockpile uh, of medical supplies. With the refugee flow significantly abating, these uh, facilities uh, set up at the border, uh, also the tem temporary uh, shelters, right now are uh, mostly empty. Now I shortly would like to uh, touch on a very specific uh, issue uh, uh, relating to Hungary. Here you can see the, the ethnic map of, uh, of Ukraine and uh, the little, very little uh, orange uh, spot uh, on the western part is the country, is the Hungarian uh, ethnic minorities. Uh, here is the, uh, another map enlarging uh, uh, the region. According to a 2017 um, estimate, there were around 150,000 uh, ethnic Hungarians uh, in the Transcarpathia region, the part, that, the part of Ukraine which is enlarged on the map. Already in uh, 2014, after the annexation of uh, uh, Crimea, there was a spike of uh, Hungarian emig uh, emigration. Uh, this, uh, after the start of the war, turned uh, into mass uh, exodus. There are some uh, Hungarian majority sub uh, administrative units in the Transcarpathia region where up to 50% uh, of the population left and uh, moved into Hungary. While at the same time, uh, thousands and thousands of uh, Ukrainian IDPs are, are moving in um, to the region uh, to flee uh, the invasion and the war in the eastern part of the country. So this can be uh, described as a huge uh, uh, demographic shift in the region um, that uh, the region itself hasn't seen uh, since the end uh, of uh, World War II. There is another issue uh, uh, that I would like to talk about. Um, the, since the start of the war, the European Union, and specifically Poland and Hungary, have been accused of applying racist double standards to the treatment of uh, Middle Eastern and African refugees uh, at the border. Uh, this has been uh, widely uh, publicized uh, in the mainstream uh, uh, American press. Uh, these um, allegations, however, miss basic facts. Uh, it is true that Ukrainian nationals can cross into the EU much easier than African nationals, but this is only because of simple administrative reasons. Since 2017, Ukrainians with a valid biometric passport can enter and stay in the Schengen area for 90 days without visa, uh, which significantly speeds up their admission as refugees into the EU. In contrast, nationals of third countries uh, when lacking a visa to the Schengen area, fleeing the age invasion, they have to go through a registration uh, process at the border, which usually includes an interview, national security screening, and the issuance of a temporary residence permit. The frustration of uh, African students uh, waiting at the EU border to be registered, watching uh, Caucasian Ukrainians wave through without a delay is understandable, but uh, it has nothing to do with racism. Uh, the above mentioned extra mechanisms ensure the protection of the external borders of the EU, and they are in indispensable even during a refugee crisis. These mechanisms, however, are also in place uh, to protect third country nationals who are fleeing the conflict. Uh, at the beginning of the conflict, a large number of Ukrainian refugees didn't really need substantial help for the countries receiving them because they already had uh, friends and relatives uh, in the EU whom they could rely on. This was not the case, obviously, for uh, third country nationals fleeing the war. Upon entering the Schengen area, they usually found, them, find, found themselves in a vacuum, and it was during these registration mechanisms that they learned about their op options and, co and could request a stay in the EU or ask for help to return home. During the first 10 days of the conflict, the e EU countries scrambled uh, to help evacuate 18,000 Indians, with Hungary alone assisting more than 6,000. Consequently, it's no surprise that uh, the Indian Prime Minister uh, 
thank Budapest for its effort uh, to help Indian nationals uh, fleeing the war. Moreover, Hungary helped to accommodate Somali as well as Bangladeshi students, even offering them the chance to continue their studies at Hungarian universities. These actions are anything uh, but racist. Uh, what are the challenges uh, for the future? If the war uh, continues uh, uh, up until the winter, it could trigger a second wave of refugees. First of all, uh, Ukraine does not have enough natural gas or oil to last through the winter, uh, and even if it did, the damage to the country's civilian inf infrastructure is significant. For example, in Kharkiv, 80% of windows on residential buildings were shattered because of the widespread use of cluster munitions by the Russian army, Cluster munitions uh, detonate in the air and release a cluster of uh, smaller uh, bombs which fall incriminately uh, over a wide area, pot potentially putting uh, civilians uh, at risk. Obviously, uh, during the summer, um, broken windows are not a huge problem, but uh, during the winter in the eastern part of Ukraine, especially if you don't have proper heating or no heating at all, uh, all those people will have to find uh, refuge either in the western part of the country or inside uh, the European Union. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and thank you for coming. Okay. Thank you very much. Or thank you. Hmm? Is it working? <laughs> It's working, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, if I may, I will see use uh, the opportunity to stay because it will be easier for me to present uh, what I prepared. Yes. So we are here. Thank you very much, first of all, to, for inviting me here and to be able to discuss the issue of refugees uh, crisis, which we have, as it was, uh, as it has been mentioned before, uh, the biggest uh, crisis, refugees crisis since 1939 that we have uh, uh, in Europe, and uh, with the with the wave and the scope uh, of the people who come, and actually the final result, which has been unpredictable, both by the Polish politicians, by the politicians in the region, but also by the whole world, I think. You can hardly hear that we've got any troubles traditionally addicted with the refugees. You can have uh, on no special crimes or uh, some any, any um, um, statements made by the um, uh, local societies, as in Poland or in Czech or in Hungary, people complaining about. Uh, me personally, I must say openly what I mentioned before, I thought that in Poland we've been ha we, 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 the, the honeymoon between Ukrainian and people will last not longer than one month, whereas we are after 100 days of war, people are not only coming here, coming to Poland, uh, staying there and uh, um, exp experiencing a scope of hospitality that has never been uh, before. As you must know also, uh, also that we've got a quite a tough historical momentum in our relationship before traditionally and it completely disappeared right now. But I will, uh, as uh, uh, has been mentioned at the beginning, I would like to present you some uh, data because I've been uh, invited by the Prime Minister Morawiecki, Prime Minister of Poland, uh, just day after uh, outbreak of war to the Chancellery of Prime Minister, uh, using my experience, former experience as the minister responsible for the economy, to uh, talk to international financial institutions, not only within the European Union, but also outside, uh, for looking for uh, the support for this uh, special and unique uh, um, refugees crisis that we are uh, having nowadays in Europe. And uh, what was, of course, uh, very important for us uh, after the, the huge first wave of um, newcomers to Poland, you can simply pr just to, 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 to envisage the process. It was in the highest momentum. It was uh, 100, 150,000 people crossing the border per day. Comparing with the former period, it was not more than 15,000, yeah? So, so if you can think only about what has happening on the border, not only on the Polish side, but also the Ukrainian one, and it was the end of February, beginning of March, when the temperature there was below uh, zero Celsius. So, so 
it was a real um, tough, uh, uh, tough momentum. And uh, 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 so we, we started to deal, to cope with those uh, people, to help them as soon as possible. Uh, in a, and uh, the, the effort that has been paid by the state institutions and the local government institutions were fully supported by the uh, NGOs and the simply single people. So the Poland has become a huge NGOs actually in that momentum. So people that has never been experienced uh, the, or has never been uh, employed or training anything in the NGOs simply started to do, they, all of them feel that yes, we have to do something with that. And people, you can meet people in the railway station, on the border, uh, opening the houses for those people on the scope and uh, which has never been uh, presented, uh, not only in Poland, I think, but you can hardly see this uh, uh, situation in any other European member state country. Finally, what has been mentioned thousand times, we don't have a refugee camps. We've got a lot of newcomers, but we have simply any single refugee camp. So all those people have been located basically in the private apartment, uh, but also by renting or arranged, organized apartments by the local municipality or, 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 or the government. So there is no such a situation that we've got the circles of Ukraine somewhere gathered together. Nothing like that is existing. But uh, just, I would like to bring you some fresh data, which are really, uh, I must say, it was the data we want simply to have a, a knowledge-based policy and to have a, to, to, to do it, to, to be able to, to understand who has come to Poland and uh, uh, whom we have on the border, what are their plans, what they want to do, what are their qualifications, how much kids do we have uh, in terms of uh, healthcare system and education system. It was, uh, so this is the survey, uh, the largest survey that has been done uh, after the outbreak of the war made in Europe. Uh, it is um, um, uh, approximately 8,000 people being questioned. Comparing to the one made in Germany, it was 2,000 people being asked. Uh, this is um, uh, more than 7,000, approximately 8,000 people asked. Uh, we did it together with the, uh, uh, so we, I mean the Chancellor of Prime Minister, together with the Ukrainian Embassy and with the support of Facebook and Google. So to, to be able to, to direct the questions as wide, as broad as it is only possible. So um, this is, uh, I know that this is not in very favor of sociologists because it is very difficult to make a proper trial, proper group of people because representation is unknown. So this is very difficult to say whether we've got the real full answers, but taking into account finally, I think it is really mm, interesting and um, important. One more thing that should be added to all of uh, those uh, preconditions is that uh, the Poland has started to issue the ID numbers for those who come for the refugees. We started to do it uh, at the end of March, beginning of April, more um, and uh, approximately 60% of those who come to Poland has applied for those IDs. But after this ID, we know only about the sex and age, nothing more. Uh, connected with that, the ID is necessary. If you, the, the ID is the enter to to is the door open to the all public services, the healthcare system, education system, everything what is necessary and what is open for the Polish citizens. It is open uh, as well for the Ukrainian. But uh, and what you see here, what is probably it is this mistake in the survey um, uh, those people who answer our questions here 90 more than 90 percent of them uh, has applied for the ID so if you compare with this total number what I mentioned that 70 percent possess it 30 percent not this is the, the the point the difference between the uh, the um, the group and the people who stay in Poland uh, Yes, the, uh, um, as I mentioned, the survey has been uh, created and distributed in cooperation with the Embassy of Ukraine in Poland and the GovTech is a part of the administration and the promotion channels, as, you, as I mentioned, it was uh, Facebook, but also the channels of communication used by the Ukrainian in Poland. Uh, so the, we've got uh, 7,505 respondents remaining uh, in Poland the ch number of children accompanied, I will say that about that a, a little bit later. 
and uh, the uh, all or accompanied by uh, by adult. Uh, Ninety-six percent of those who answered the questions uh, were women, and this is the real this shape of the population because as you know the young boys uh, and and uh, men's men uh, man could not leave uh, ukraine uh, because of the war reasons um 39 is the average age uh, of uh, adults respondents of our survey uh, eight point uh, eight years and half is the average age of um, uh, children um, uh, so this is also important in terms of the school preparation but also the openness for entering the labor uh, the labor market uh, and top three uh, previous regions of residence in ukraine is uh, kiev non, it is not uh, difficult to answer the capital city dnipro pietrovsk and uh, and the kharkiv and top three current uh, localization of respondents in poland is a polish capital city warsaw Krakow, the former capital city, and uh, Wrocław nearby traditionally connected. In Wrocław, we've got a huge uh, um, uh, um, uh, amount of people. Wrocław has been addicted to Poland, added to Poland after the Second World War, and located strongly by Polish people coming from Lviv before you being Poles from Lviv before the Second World War. So it, it is also the traditional place when the Ukrainian before, uh, uh, before outbreak of, of, of the current war um, has been. So, uh, so, but anyway, definitely the big uh, cities uh, were the first uh, choice, uh, choice of, of those who come to, to, uh, to Poland. Structure of population of refugees um, uh, residing in Poland. If you see on this uh, left side, uh, you've got the age, uh, which is uh, very important. So 48% of population uh, is in a productive uh, uh, age. That means that this is the capital for the labor market as well, right? So 48% so, um, are, are under uh, 18 years um, mm, uh, years old the gender as i mentioned before 96 six percent women only four percent men if you think it has been said uh, at the beginning before uh, the the way the means of uh, transportation so 50 uh, to 52 percent come to poland uh, with public public buses mainly arranged by the state the polish state 25% by railways, also uh, arranged by the and paid by 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 state. Um, on car, 14%. It was at the very beginning, first two weeks. It was those comers, those refugees who come uh, with their own cars, and also uh, the riders offered by the private individuals. Uh, the, the, and the last point uh, is uh, this um, 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 uh, traveling, how many people are with families that come to Poland? Uh, only 21% travel alone, uh, um, um, uh, another 50% cross uh, the border with a maximum of two companions, either one old person, grandma, grandpa, and one kid or two kids. What it uh, gosh, yes, thank you. Uh, th so, so j just to sum up this, what has been mentioned, the um, we we are having nowadays uh, connecting with the dates uh, uh, for the 30 of May. 1.4 million, uh, this is the estimated number of Ukrainian refugees residing in Poland. This is not according to the survey, but according to the knowledge that we have from the border guards. Yes, so uh, so, so this is the number of people residing in Poland. 61% of them stayed in a temporary accommodation free of charge. I'm mentioning that because there are we, we will have some conclusions regarding how to deal with this group of, uh, uh, of people. Not more than half a million of people. Uh, this is the estimated size of the new Ukrainian diaspora. So those people who declare themselves to stay in Poland for a longer, yes? so to, who are not willing to come back to, 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 to Ukraine. Uh, if you think uh, um, about employment, um, 
and uh, financial independence. This is one important uh, issue, which is uh, that uh, up to 80% of adults have uh, has savings for approximately one month, 60% for not more than uh, two months. And uh, uh, th th this amount also of, uh, of people is looking for a new job, which is a good, uh, good message. They are not waiting for uh, the support, but, th but they are willing to enter to the labor market. Now, and uh, uh, also 80% of them decla declaring that the lack of uh, uh, language skills is a main barrier to the entering uh, to, the, uh, to, this, uh, to this market. Although the, our languages are very similar, Still, it is not enough to enter fully, safely. It is enough to go to the shop. It is enough to go to the pub to, to use from for some public services. But this is definitely not enough to enter to the labor market, especially if you think about the qualifications of those people, which is also uh, unique comparing with the former previous uh, refugees uh, crisis. Mm -hmm. Okay, not that one, yes. Uh, uh, there are da some data uh, uh, grabbed not from the survey and the questions, but from the, from the, um, mm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not doing anything. Uh, from uh, from SIM cards, where, so the location of those people, and this is what I uh, what I said uh, before. They are gathered mostly in the biggest cities, so Warsaw, the south part, it is Krakow, southwest uh, is uh, is uh, uh, Wrocław. As just to see the process is that. Uh, oh no, we are in a table, I think. Sorry. Uh, so, so we've got at the beginning, uh, in the peak momentum, we've got 3 million point seven uh, uh, people that crossed the Polish border. Uh, 1.7 up t uh, until now um, has come back to Ukraine and uh, um, um, 0.6 has already left for other pr places outside Ukraine and outside um, Poland. 1.4, this is this estimated number of people currently uh, residing um, uh, in Poland. If I may ask for the next one, if it is possible. Uh, if, if we think of the accommodation, as I mentioned at the beginning, we don't have any uh, uh, um, refugee camp. Uh, so uh, more than 60% of those who come to Poland uh, uh, resist in uh, unpaid accommodations, uh, 39 in a paid accommodation. Mainly they stay in the private individuals, so someone who is not connected by, by um, as the family or friends, the Ukrainian, because it is worth to be mentioned that before outbreak of war, we've got one million of Ukrainian uh, being on the labor market in Poland. So that came in a last five, six years to Poland for, for looking for the job and staying in Poland, working in Poland. So a lot of those who come after 24th of February simply find the accommodation in this one million uh, diaspora already um, located in Poland. But another, um, uh, almost two million, another, firstly stayed in the Polish private uh, um, 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 uh, apartments. Family, friends, as I mentioned, thank you family and friends, uh, but also the public shelter, which is not very significant, uh, um, uh, rented apartments uh, as well. But what is important, uh, the, this, the future accommodation, because it, it describes what are the plans of the, those people, what they really want to do in Poland. The 44% uh, of them are answering that they want to rent a house, rent a flat, rent an, rent an accommodation. That means that they want to find a job, in, uh, earn money for them, and uh, being able to pay for the, uh, for the accommodation. This is really very, uh, very important. So in the short term, the um, accommodation, refugees plan to stay for about one, um, up to three months. In the long run, people want to rent uh, their, um, uh, the apartments, the accommodations.
so uh, it is just the, the, the maybe might be interested that uh, uh, the accommodation with no charge are broadly mainly um, um, presented in the west part of Poland. So Lublin, you see uh, the city, the biggest city close to the uh, eastern border, so close to the Ukrainian and Belarus border. Also in Warsaw, further western, more uh, paid uh, uh, paid uh, apartments, uh, and uh, basically types uh, of accommodation by city. So the private market, as you see, the yellow one is the uh, is the biggest uh, the biggest share. And education, very interesting situation because in the it is as as we said there is a lot of kids that come to Poland, and uh, uh, the um, the year the average uh, structure of age is uh, so that the average age is uh, a bit uh, above uh, eight years old, but uh, so we've got half million children in the school broadly school uh, school age because the kindergarten is a kind of a, a well organized uh, uh, taker system uh, primary and secondary school uh, nursery and uh, under si uh, one years old it is only six percent and uh, what has happened when they come to Poland, it was of course a big openness of the schools and people, some of them come to the Polish schools, but it was just in the middle of the term when uh, the education, uh, the distance education has been still organized by the Ukrainian side. And a lot of them decided to finish, to complete the school year in the Ukrainian system. It is very difficult, of course, to enter to the school system just in the middle and to be classified. And then those people still were thinking, a lot of them, that they will come back soon to the Ukraine. So they decided to do that. And that is why what did the, Ukra the Polish government decided to offer the uh, laptops and uh, access to the internet for them rather than force them and push them to come to the Polish schools. And the, the whole system, the educational system, is now being prepared for the 1st September when the education, when the school year is starting in Poland to accept and to, uh, to, 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 be, o to be open for those uh, Ukrainian population who want to come uh, to, to, to the school. And who is going to, to come? Uh, as you see, more than 50% want to come uh, to the, uh, when the school year is started, to send the Ukrainian students to the Polish uh, school system. And this is, of course, the, the philosophical question regarding the school system, whether, and it was a discussion, and it is still a discussion in Poland with the Ukrainian side, whether we should prepare the Ukrainian schools with the Ukrainian system in Poland for the Ukrainian kids, or rather, we should support them to enter to the Polish uh, system. Well, th my experience as the former member of the government is rather, we remember we've got, Polish has, P Poland has got quite a significant minority in Germany. It is the biggest minority uh, in, the, in, in Germany. We are, I would say even the combating the each government after 1989 is combating for having the you know Sunday Polish schools in Germany being conducted by the Polish minority for the Polish kids and we are not allowed to do it in Germany. So our idea was that yes we it is allowed to arrange the the the, the, the Ukrainian school in Poland and it can be done by the Polish NGOs or by the Ukrainian society or by, by anyone. Uh, under the Ukrainian regulation framework, but it is not going to be organized by the, let's say, the government side. Yeah, so, so the government side, uh, I literally know, lack of, lack of time. Uh, so the government side is uh, preparing the system to enter the, those kids to the, to the Polish um, system. The savings, important issue. Uh, um, uh, the 90% of eligible, uh, uh, eligible refugees of working age have sufficient savings for a maximum of two months. Huge challenge for the labor market, not going if you want, not delivering only fish, but rather opportunities. This is the real uh, uh, challenge uh, that, uh, that we are having. But what is very promising, 81% of those of refugees are looking for the jobs. And the news from the today in the morning, uh, 230,000 people, Ukrainian people, 
have uh, already find themselves on the Polish labor market, means being employed officially. I presume that another 200,000 is doing that unofficially, but this is really very significant amount of people in a very short period of time enter the, uh, the labor uh, market. What is important for the structure of those refugees? We've got, as I mentioned, one million Ukrainian people before. The educational structure of those people who are now coming is much higher. We've got people with a higher education, uh, skills like the the, uh, uh, the administration, the education, um, um, a lot of um, a lot of them are lawyers, uh, architects. So so completely different structure of refugees uh, that come to to Poland. This is being presented on the next slide. And uh, uh, this is also a, a completely different situation with that if we compare it with other refugee crises in a, uh, like in 2014 in Europe or even before. So this is completely different social um, uh, social structure. Just to make a, a, a brief uh, uh, comment and to see those final final uh, numbers, 1.4 million come to Poland. Uh, during last 100 days, 61% uh, uh, temporary accommodated for free. Uh, half million, this is going to be the new Ukrainians living for longer period uh, in Poland. Uh, not very well equipped financially. That is why looking for the job and open for that. Ready for reskilling. This is also important. They are ready to change uh, their professions. And uh, um, uh, so and with the kids ready to come to enter to uh, to the Polish uh, uh, school um, school system, the huge challenge for for the coming months it is the labor market of course, and uh, uh, and the accommodation. We've got a shortage of accommodation even before the refugees crisis. So offering the preparing the market in the of course in the very uncertain period with the huge inflation changing cost of construction it is a biggest it is one of the biggest challenge that we have to face with and uh, uh, but what is the optimistic and out of this um, survey that what i mentioned at the beginning we don't have any uh, hesitation any and a darkness on the, on the Polish society, whether we should support or not those Ukraine. We feel, and the notion that this is also our war is very deeply uh, rooted in Poland. Because, why? B because we were talking about the Russian as a th threat for a very long period. So not only the right-wing parties, but also the left, it is a common sense in Poland. So we feel that this battle, this is the first battle when the West West uh, and the East uh, world is combating itself, first time not being conducted on the Pol Polish soil. And that is why we are so ready. That's true. That That is really true. Uh, uh, and this is why we are so strongly and uh, uh, supporting those who come here. And that is why the, 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 the Polish authorities are so strongly politically supportive for the, for the Ukrainian uh, politicians nowadays and the Ukrainian part in this uh, uh, awful war. Uh, the crisis, the biggest as it was, by the, the refugees crisis, but I would say that uh, dealt in a very unpresidential way uh, uh, that might be as an example for the rest and what I must say he being here as well, it costs a lot. Yeah, so in, term in terms of simply the tough money. Yeah, and uh, if we think about support, that would be worth to be spread, that this support is necessary not only now, because when the summertime is started, the consciousness and the interest of this war and also of those refugees is not going to be that strong as it is now. And But we need this support to support those people for a definitely longer period. That is why uh, it would be good in the presence in the places like this one here to once again maintain this uh, attention towards the process that is going on in the Central Europe right now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again. Can you hear me? And um, yeah. Uh, so
So maybe you are already tired from the figures. Uh, I will show you photos to refresh you. Uh, about our field trip to Romania and Moldova uh, in early May, which wasn't organized by me because I am dealing with the uh, migration in the Mediterranean EU countries, but uh, one of our junior analysts. And uh, I joined because it was so new for me to see a real refugee situation. I'm used to the Greek islands, I'm used to the Italian French uh, Alpine border where the movement of uh, um, irregular migrants from other uh, continents uh, is a daily experience, uh, but not a refugee crisis in a neighboring country. So that's why uh, I joined uh, my colleagues, and uh, we were uh, we visited uh, two uh, border crossing points in Romania and uh, one reception center in Moldova. So the first picture you can see uh, the first, uh, our first stop, which was Sigetul Marmatie, uh, which is uh, in the northwestern part of uh, Romania, and you can see the river there, it's Tisa, and this bridge, which can accommodate uh, one vehicle at a time, uh, and the other side is the Ukraine. So you can imagine that in the first days uh, when the war erupted, uh, on a daily basis, uh, 2,700 people arrived through this bridge, uh, the majority of them uh, on foot, uh, but it was a very hard situation to uh, handle. This is a small capacity, as you can see. From the Ukrainian side, you can see the Romanian side, and there, there are my colleagues and interpreter with uh, uh, the officer in charge there. Uh, it's a wooden bridge, and it was uh, built in 1924, uh, so you can imagine uh, that it, this is a situation you uh, can handle easily, and uh, the girls and uh, uh, the people with bicycles are uh, internally displaced persons in the Ukraine. Uh, so uh, they are not uh, refugees in a sense that they haven't left the Ukraine, but if uh, would be still uh, a very heavy bombing, they would immediately cross and stay in Romania. So they are staying on this side where we are, of course, uh, in the, the Ukrainian side, but they go on a daily basis shopping to Romania. Uh, now you can see from Romania the Ukrainian uh, side. So uh, these movements are, are regular, and when a vehicle comes, <coughs> everybody should step aside as we stepped aside when a vehicle came. Uh, immediately when the war erupted, um, <coughs> the NGOs were there and set up these tents for helping. You can see Meda, th th this woman is a coordinator of this uh, helping point called Blue Dot. This is the tent of Blue Dot, and th these are several NGOs uh, representing, these people uh, representing several NGOs uh, from Romania. You can see a lot of drawings from other continents, even from the US, of course, from children to those children in need. Uh, basically, um, Romanian authorities expected at this uh, border crossing point 10,000 people uh, a day, uh, but uh, th this uh, figure has, hasn't been reached uh, since, so, um, that's why uh, I, I have, um, I, I told you that uh, p most people were staying on the other side, are still staying on the other side, or uh, just uh, uh, coming um, uh, for shopping, for instance. So, uh, but, but those who came, uh, they, they don't stay here for long. Uh, they went uh, immediately uh, to other European countries, uh, for example, uh, Poland or the Czech Republic, uh, where there is a bigger Ukrainian minority. So Romania is still a transit uh, uh, country. Uh, this uh, is uh, the eastern uh, part uh, of Romania. Uh, uh, it is a village called Skuleni, which is a, also a border crossing with Moldova. And this is a so-called helping point. It's near uh, the main road. Uh, you can see on the right maybe a container with uh, the flags. And this is a bus uh, which uh, departed from Moldova and uh, went to Germany. And it was just a stopping uh, point for them to have some refreshment. You see women and children with all their stuff, with uh, their uh, pets also. So uh, the bus was full and full of uh, stuff. Uh, um, all the valuables uh, they had 
it, it was packed on this bus. Uh, there they got uh, some, uh, some rest and uh, some help, and they continued their journey uh, to Western Europe. Sorry. The other crossing point we visited, it was in uh, northeastern Romania. Uh, it was uh, it called uh, Siret. Uh, this is a much larger, uh, as you see, there are six lanes. You see the officers, and behind them there are six lanes. One lane, uh, when the war broke out, uh, was uh, uh, made to um, uh, for, for the traffic uh, to the Ukraine, and the other five from Ukraine. Two, uh, three lanes, I think, yeah, they were for uh, uh, women and uh, children, one lane for students, and one for cars. Uh, so it was uh, quite easy. Uh, it's much, it was much easier to handle the situation here, uh, and they uh, were moving, the people uh, uh, could get in, into Romania quite quickly. It was very, very cold uh, uh, in the end of uh, February, so they needed immediate help. So for about uh, 200 or 300 meters uh, now, even now, uh, we have these uh, tents. On the right side, you have uh, we have tents for uh, immediate uh, um, medical assistance, for example. On the other side, there are the, the, all the volunteers. Uh, there are a lot of NGOs there. Uh, till uh, this day, uh, uh, they have counted uh, 150 NGOs. Uh, there in uh, Siret, uh, present there. Uh, but uh, when we were there in May, there were uh, 47 NGOs present, all of a kind. Uh, this is a helping point also at, at the border. So uh, this, this is, uh, uh, after a quick registration, uh, you, can handle, uh, you can't handle, you can't handle, Aslam came here, uh, it's, it's another place in another village nearby, but, uh, uh, it's a quick registration point, and of course uh, they can have rest and uh, food and uh, whatever they need I immediately from these NGOs, uh, which are there in a really high number. For example, uh, the Jewish community, or you can uh, see a uh, Greek Orthodox Pope here. Uh, uh, the churches, uh, uh, these these religious communities were the first uh, who uh, were there. Uh, on the day uh, of uh, 24th of uh, February, so they were the first uh, civilians to, to help. So in Moldova, now we are in the capital in uh, Chisinau. Uh, you see, this is the Mold Expo, which of course wasn't designed for uh, helping people. Uh, Mold Expo is an exhibition center with great halls, and uh, this is one of them, you see, uh, it's not uh, really uh, proper uh, uh, for this activity, but they turned to this uh, great uh, uh, helping uh, center, so Moldovans uh, were immediately transferred uh, this exhibition center to, uh, for hosting refugees before it was a COVID uh, helping point, uh, uh, by the way, so uh, who are working there, they are not experts on this refugee issue, they are just uh, commerce, uh, dealing with commerce for uh, like 20, uh, uh, for 20 years, so they had to change their mindset immediately and focus uh, and to focus on, um, on helping uh, people in need. Yeah, and you can see uh, one of uh, uh, the places, uh, this little uh, playroom from children, uh, I think they uh, did a great job here. You can see the store where a lot of uh, uh, donations are placed, uh, mostly uh, blankets and uh, little tons of food. Uh, nowadays, it, uh, the problem is not the lack of uh, capacity uh, because uh, in Mold Expo, and of course they have several reception points in the country, not just in Chisinau, but in Mold Expo they have uh, 430 uh, places. Uh, now it is about uh, 300 people there. Uh, of course, the overwhelming majority are uh, women and children whose uh, husband or father is uh, fighting uh, against the uh, Russian army at home. Uh, so there is uh, this kind of fatigue uh, that the Moldovans also were very, very helpful uh, and uh, donated a 
really, really a huge quantity uh, blankets and stuff and, and clothes. Uh, for example, now the biggest issue in Mold Expo is that they don't have summer clothes because everybody came in winter clothing uh, in February. It was uh, very cold, but it's getting uh, uh, hotter and hotter and uh, they don't have uh, enough of summer clothing. Uh, of course, here also many, many NGOs are present. For example, this is uh, a SAMU, which is a medical uh, assistance team, and uh, these people uh, came from Spain. Uh, they are uh, uh, doctors and other medical uh, staff who are helping uh, 20 uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, you know, uh, 24, 24 hours a day, while they, they are staying there. International uh, NGOs, international volunteers, of course, they stay for two weeks or four weeks, while Moldovan and Romanian NGOs who are helping, they are still permanently there, so uh, that's the difference. A and my last pick, of course, is the picture of hope. I think everybody uh, here in this room uh, uh, hopes for a better future and uh, peace in, in the Ukraine. This was made in uh, Siget, our first uh, stop at the uh, border crossing was with the uh, gendarmerie, uh, the local police, and uh, the tent of uh, Red Cross. After a short rain, uh, you can see the rainbow. Thank you so much. I want to have kids. Uh, so, like Mark said, I'm going to talk about the United States response to the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, briefly, you can go online to NIS.org and see uh, multiple reports there on the subject. Um, in the beginning, when, when all this happened, uh, the Biden administration wanted to focus on proximity help, meaning helping refugees in the region, uh, providing financial humanitarian uh, aid uh, to Ukrainians in Europe and to the countries that was hosting them. Um, a little bit after that, a little with, with some pressure from perhaps refugee ad advocates, Biden, President Biden, when he went to Brussels, he said, we're going to bring 100,000 uh, to uh, the US. And when we talk about refugees, the, the one one uh, main uh, uh, pathway for refugees to the United States is re the refugee resettlement program, which is a refugee leaves the country of war, goes to a country host country, and then those who cannot stay in the hosting country for several reasons are brought to the United States. There's, there's a specific program with specific budget, specific ceiling, we call it ceiling, target on refugees, how many can come. But uh, this, that said, not so many Ukrainian refugees have been coming to the United States even after this crisis. Uh, in the past decade, around 19,000 Ukrainians have, have uh, come. This fiscal year, from October through May, only some less than 900 refugees came. They come mainly through a program called um, the Lautenberg program that was set in the 1990s that is, was uh, supposedly set for uh, people in the Soviet Union, the then Soviet Union, who were uh, had uh, religious persecution. So they would come as a group. It was an easier uh, way to apply and come, not an individual uh, process of persecution. It, they needed just to be part of this group, religious group, to be able to be admitted. So these uh, Ukrainian refugees, we expect perhaps more of, of, of them. Another uh, uh, measure the Biden administration took was to give uh, Ukrainians over here TPS, which is temporary protected status, which is not the same as the European one. The, you, you read about it, but the US has limited benefits linked to that. They just, it means they can stay and they don't need to go back. And uh, what it also did on the border is with Title 42, which is because of COVID, uh, uh, you couldn't really apply for asylum and you, you were able 
to be returned back from where you were, Mexico and stuff like that. For you, for Ukrainians, they had the exemption. They could come and apply for asylum or come and, and be given parole, which is kind of a, a way to say come, um, author authorization to enter the country. It's not uh, an immigration status. So that's in a nutshell what's been happening. That exemption, the last exemption, supposedly ended on April 25th because what the Biden administration did is create a new program called Uniting for Ukraine. Now, it's supposedly a private uh, sponsorship program. It's a streamlined process. It's quicker because it's kind of all online. What happens is that somebody, a U.S.-based, they call them U.S.-based supporter, is in the United States, agrees to bring one beneficiary, an Ukrainian or a non-Ukrainian, if it's family member of a Ukrainian, who had left Ukraine because following this crisis, and vouch, uh, pledge, and uh, uh, apply with online for a form it's called Declaration of Financial Support. So this US-based supporter will say, I'm going to support financially this Ukrainian for the length of his stay, okay? And then the, the, the Ukrainian ben beneficiary can come under parole. He's not coming under refugee status. Uh, who, uh, the, the, the US-based supporter in a nutshell doesn't need to be only a U.S. citizen or green card hoarder or, you know, U.S. national, American. Uh, they can be also asylees, parolees, those who uh, have uh, deferred uh, uh, enforcement, uh, DED, I forgot what it's called. It's, anyway. So, so multiple people, asylees, uh, can, can apply for this, uh, to bring a, a Ukrainian here. What they need to do is say, we support the person. Now, however, this financial support can be, it can come from multiple sources. It doesn't come to, need to come just from one person. So if, if I'm supporting a, a Ukrainian beneficiary, I don't need to have money. Organizations, NGOs, anybody can say, okay, we're going to add to this support uh, list and it will be taken into account. At the same time also, and I think that's a, a bit ironic, a Ukrainian who is coming as a beneficiary can, can add as a support his home in Ukraine or any assets he has. Anyway, it's, 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 a, it's a process all online. The, the form is sent and then after vetting, etc., cetera, et cetera, the, the, the Ukrainian uh, can come. Each each uh, form has to be just for one, even if they're multiple families. So if, if you want to support different people, you have to have another form. Um, so before they come, if they are approved, uh, they have to have an attestation. It's not uh, a test. It's just an attestation that they had a COVID test polio, etc. There's there's one, two, three uh, uh, medical attestation that they need vaccine. They need to have. So that's a, a quick process. So here's what where it's it becomes interesting to me. What I found uh, parole. If when they come under parole, they don't have access to benefits, federal benefits, money resettlement, refugee resettlement benefits. However, there's a new bill that. Uh, was passed and is, it signed into law by uh, Biden um, in May that gives uh, Ukrainian parolees the same refugee resettlement benefits as a refugee. So a parolee will come here with the benefits. Supposedly, it's financed privately. However, they will receive also public benefits. At the same time, if an organization is allowed to sponsor the Ukrainian benefit, indirectly, not directly, one person has to, indirectly, it's federal money. There are nine organizations, we call them refugee resettlement agencies, who work with the US State Department to help refugees when they come under the refugee resettlement program. They are funded by the 
U.S. government by taxpayers' money. So these who take money from the U.S. government can list themselves as a supporter, financier of the Ukrainian, and then the Ukrainian will be accepted. It's kind of a circling the, 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 the thing. Uh, also, remember that the paroli now, following this bill, can also get benefits. So a parolee who gets benefits can now sponsor a Ukrainian who will come under a parolee with, with the same benefits. So, so it, it is, it is uh, we need to be very careful when we, we look at the, th the, the, the fine print, as we say, and understand how this money, where it's coming from, and perhaps what is uh, portrayed as a private sponsorship is not as private as what, what we think it is. Uh, money, we, we talked about the support, uh, uh, lots of financial aid has been given to, to uh, uh, Ukrainian refugees and the countries who are hosting them. The last bill, I think, I'm, I'm only talking about humanita humanitarian aid for refugees and food and etc. Uh, it's like six billion, I think, with this new, uh, with this new bill. So uh, I think I've said enough. No? Okay. Uh, I'm, honestly, I think I've said enough. What, 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 what is really interesting here is that we are resettling, supposedly resettling Ukrainians or bringing them under parole by giving them the refugee resettlement benefits who are not in a country of war, who have gone to Europe, who have are been, giving, uh, been given benefits in Europe temporary protective status, etc. And uh, and I'll end because Mark said it. Thank you, everyone. We have time for uh, just a couple of questions, but one question I wanted to direct to um, uh, to anybody on the panel, really, but for the Europeans in particular. Uh, does, for instance, the government of Poland or, in your experience, Hungary or Romania, do they want the United States to take more of these people off their hands? In other words, is there any, I don't know, sense or discussion that they would kind of prefer that more of these people move to the United States? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that at the very beginning when we predict what we can expect after with the refugees crisis, whether it is going to be 3 million or 8 or even 11, comparing with the previous refugees crisis from Syria, comparing with the other places in the world. If it is 11 or 8 million, that definitely would be, an, uh, definitely would be the, the strong diplomatic action according in the government to try to find them good shelter outside Poland. But if it is 1.3, even if it is even double, we try to count how much we can really easily digest, right, in Poland. And the, the answer was that probably a maximum, approximately, it is 2.5, 2.7 million. So I would say nowadays it is not necessary to, 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 to take them from Poland. Definitely not. I would say that they, they simply feel better in Poland because it is closer to the Ukraine, closer cultural everything is easier. So they've been there. A lot of friends of them are working here. So if I may say once again, please do help us to help those people in Poland. But, and it is much more efficient simply and more humanitarian support than any other mean. Hmm? Now, on a more broader European perspective, now we have almost 5 million uh, refugees uh, in Europe. Uh, if the United States takes 100,000, it's just a droplet in the sea. I mean, uh, I think that the European Union uh, can uh, handle this uh, refugee crisis. We don't need the EU, uh, the United States, to, uh, to take in refugees. We need LNG and yeah. oil. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good answer. Good answer. But also, mm -hmm. Mark, yes. just, just, uh, all, the, all the funding that's going yeah. that, it, in the bill and it, previous bills by the United States government to these countries it is 
Do you see the money? Is it well, effective? Is it? This is what I try to say, and that is why I put such a strong pressure. We've got a huge, uh, no, uh, massive amount of NGOs who are supportive, but. Uh, if you compare the amount of money dedicated to support refugees, the let's say the NGO sector and the government, of course the government is paying more. And for those money who cannot be covered by any other organization, like uh, railways, like uh, shelters, like working, like uh, the healthcare system. And what is with during the many of panels or meetings, working meetings with the the big international NGOs who are supportive, we said that whether you can change the regulation, and I was told that it must be changed by the regulatory framework in the US, that those organizations could support the agencies, the government agencies or local government agencies directly, because this is a massive expenditure. Mm. So if you ask me whether we see, we are aware of this flow of money coming to NGOs, but we can't see that, honestly speaking, supportive the government in uh, delivering services to those people. Mm. Okay. Um, we have one or two questions. Uh, Yes. Um, as, someone who's not, oh, as someone who's not followed the issues in Europe, I just want to say first, it's very impressive all the things the European countries are doing. But let me ask the harder question. At some point, the war will be over. And there's an old saying, there's nothing as permanent as a temporary refugee. So in the United States, by the way, our refugees, the official refugees, are assumed to be permanent residents and eventual citizens. So that's different. But that's a specific category. The term refugee can mean many things. But refugees and asylees in the United States who get that status are on their way to permanent residence. But in your countries, has anyone given any thought of how to encourage people to go home once the war is over? And how is that going to be dealt with? Experience suggests that's extraordinarily difficult, particularly for developed countries. <laughs> well, at the at the European level, the temporary protection directive uh, can only run for three years. Mm -hmm. It can be renewed for up to three years. And also, if we look at the the data published by uh, uh, by Euro, uh, the Statistic Institute of the of the EU, we see that the amount of people that actually filed an asylum claim, uh, a regular asylum claim, that could give them a uh, um, permanent status is still very, very low. But we are very early in the conflict. But once again, to compare the situation with the, previ with the let's say, another refugees that come to, po to Europe uh, in the former years, it is completely different because when, I, uh, when we ask those people, why do you don't apply for ID number? And the answer is for the, f among those Ukraine is because we don't want to feel like a refugee. We don't want to, to put this label on us. They are from th this. Uh, this is not that far away from their um, um, uh, cities, their country, and they feel that is why they declare. We don't know how many of them, how much of them, how many of them would stay in Poland for a longer period. But they most massively, they declare they want to come back to Ukraine. We don't know whether it happened or not, of mm -hmm. course, because we don't know how this war is going to look like. And uh, w me personally, I'm very pessimistic about that. But uh, but still, they don't feel like being refugees. And that is why they don't apply also in this asylum procedure, the European asylum pro um, procedure. Uh, last question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Hi. Do we have data on how much housing prices and rent has gone up in Poland in the past few months? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do have, uh, but uh, this is not that easy. This is not that because of a lot of people are applying for that and the shortage, there is a shortage on the market, but we've got 13% of inflation nowadays. So th th this is what we observe, this is tremendous, yes. So 19 in Estonia, uh, 15 in Czech Republic, average in Eurozone 8%. So, so the rapid growth of prices connected with the inflation and we've, we've, we've seen this uh, growth in approximately 13%, not because of the Ukrainian uh, applying and the shortage of, of uh, apartments, but because of the inflation. Well, I'm going to have to end it there to respect everybody's time. Uh, thanks uh, to all of our speakers. This whole uh, presentation will be on our website, the video of it. And I think if we can have the... Um, 
slides as yes, well, sir. we would include those for people to be able to look at more carefully at their leisure. Um, thanks everyone for coming. I think there's uh, some refreshment in the back uh, since it's lunchtime. And again, um, our website, Center for Immigration Studies is cis.org. And let's uh, thank all the speakers one last time. Thank you very much.